today I want to look at um, the history, well, the, the idea is the, connect, the historical connection of the countercultural interest in, um, in all things Eastern, but I want to put that in, in a larger context, so we're going to look at the counterculture a bit, and we're going to take it up to our, the arguments about consumer culture and Western kind of capitalist ideology that we've looked at. But I also want to go a bit further back um, to, to look at the, the very long history of uh, Western interest in, um, in all things Eastern. And that's flipped around a bit historically between China in particular as, a, as, a, as an idea, as a place for Westerners to be interested in, and India and Japan, um, because intellectual history has fashions too, so it's not, um, it's not quite as much a new thing, it's not just after the Second World War you had hippies, or you had the beat generation, then you had hippies and so on who were interested in, in, in India and, and backpacking and all the rest of it. So we'll do a very quick um, whistle-stop tour of European thinkers' interest in the East, just to show you that it's not that long a history and to kind of connect it in, uh, it's not that new, it's not that short a history. And that it changes around quite a lot, the nature of intellectual and cultural interests move around. And the idea of that is to sort of help you to think about um, what might be behind certain forms of cultural interest, cultural themes, cultural styles. And we'll build on that over the next few weeks by looking at... Um, film, television, and, and music, and sounds, uh, and fashion, and style. So then we're going to look through, a walk through the chapter that I set you to read from a book called The Rebel Cell, How the Counterculture Became Consumer Culture, which is the, the PDF that I emailed around. It's, it's, um, it's, turns out you can't get an e-book of that. There's no e-book of it, so we had to use the scan. And then, interestingly... Um, I learned today, who was it who emailed me and let me know about this? Someone said the reading, the, the buying Buddha selling roomies not, not available online. We thought it was available online as an e-book, so the people who sell the e-books, uh, or lease them really, um, took our money for this in January, but for some reason it's not available, This um, the book buying Buddha selling roomie. So I'm sorry about that, but it will be available soon, but our librarian has to go and like roll up his sleeves and, and get really tough with the publishers for not, um, for not providing what, what we paid for. But I'll talk to you about that as well and give you some suggestions for how to fill the, the time between now and when we actually receive that book. There are other things you can read too. Or we can just get by with the, the Rebel Cell chapter. Um, so... History of ideas. Um, what we think of as the, the Western world has long had an interest in the Eastern world. So um, the ancient Greeks were very interested in um, what they called the, the gymnosophists. Um, Indian mystics and intellectuals who they associated with um, you know, walking around or sitting around with no clothes on rejecting all material things, um, what we would think of today as kind of like modern day yogis and so on. And then um, 13th century figures like Marco Polo, there's a Netflix thing isn't there, a Marco Polo, um, which is almost unwatchable I found, but um, Marco Polo's expeditions to China in the 13th century really kind of frazzled people's brains and kicked off a whole tradition in Europe of thinking about travel, travel literature, Gulliver's Travels, all of these type of texts. Um, Robinson Crusoe, like the, the mystical, strange, exotic, beyond the known world. People travelling to, to China and meeting Kublai Khan and all the rest of it. But it was really the, the 16th century. Um, ultimately ultimately kind of imperious and colonizing type of discourses that really um, fanned the flames of this interest. So for the next few slides, um, the page numbers refer to a book 
called Oriental Enlightenment by J.J. J. Clark, which is, a, which is a, an interesting book that goes through the history of, of Western interests in, um, in Asia. So we're going to go through it. We're going through this book, Oriental Enlightenment, or some of it. Um, so what J.J. J. Clark's interest is, is um, reflecting on the... Yes, we know that the world has been globalised, has been westernised by kind of Western European capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, the expansion of, of, of capitalism around the world. We know all about that, that history is written about that. But he's interested in, in what is referred to here as an Eastern invasion of the West, more hidden and less spectacular than the Western invasion, but truly significant. So the kind of intellectual, cultural, philosophical, religious and other interactions and interconnections between the European world and the non-European world, in this case, uh, the Asian world. Um, so here we go. First big deal. Confucius! So, <laughs> have we heard of Confucius? Um, Confucius, um, ancient Chinese figure, hugely um, continuing significance within this kind of the, 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 the theory and practice of Chinese society. Um, Confucius has been a huge figure in, intele in, in Western intellectual thinking um, since the 16th century at least, since the time of these of these globalizing um, travels around the world of Europeans. So this is, it's interesting, this is a structure that we'll see, we'll see again and again. The frequent use was made of the Orient as a means of satirizing European institutions by affecting to scrutinize them with the eyes of a foreigner, a literary device which helped to elude the attentions of the official censor. So, um, the idea of how would you explain this to a foreigner? How would you explain this to an alien? How would you explain this institution to someone from another world or another culture? This is a very long tradition, um, and as pointed out here, it's a way to avoid um, censorship or kind of legal um, or imperial or royal kind of um, punishment. So, um, J.J. Clark gives loads of examples of the way in which Confucius was used through the 16th, 17th and 18th century. Confucius was often presented as incredibly enlightened, incredibly wise, and someone whose, whose thought processes and, and philosophy could offer a lot to kind of rethinking and changing European institutions. Um, I thought this was quite interesting. So Malebranche in, in the 17th century, so Malebranche takes it for granted in the 17th century that his readers will be familiar with Confucianism, assuming they will um, see its relevance to the debate in which he was engaged. As with many subsequent Enlightenment thinkers, Oriental philosophy is deployed as a potent weapon in which to engage with purely European objectives, a strategy which, a tr strategy which we will encounter in many contexts right up to the present time. We've seen this in different ways throughout this module already. The idea that there'll be some kind of internal Western European cultural debate and at the external, the other, is engaged as a way to, really th to get some kind of leverage on that to get a fixed point, to get a different perspective. So Confucianism is presented as an alternative to European institutions, as a way to recast and rethink and possibly critically change those institutions. Um, the philosophy of Leibniz. I always, I always doubt, is it Leibniz or Leibniz? One of them's chocolate and one of them's a philosopher, right? Which one is it? Leibniz? Leibniz. Do you know what? If I looked this up now, I would forget again anyway. It's like schedule and schedule. It's like I have no idea which one I meant to say. Schedule? Schedule. Leibniz? Leibniz. I don't know. Anyway, doesn't matter, right? It, it probably matters very much to people with that surname, but... Um, 
so philosophers like um, <coughs> I, um, uh, s spend a lot of time transmitting Asian ideas in 17th century Europe. Um, through the 17th and 18th century, um, Shinwazari kicked off. I caught the end of um, Antiques Roadshow on Sunday, and it was really interesting that uh, a woman uh, was presenting... You know, Antiques Roadshow, where people take stuff from their house, and then they're hugely disappointed by how much the, the expert says it's worth. They kind of go, we've got this, this thing, it's, it's this thing, and it's been in our family forever. And they go, yeah, that's actually really interesting. It's bloody brilliant, that. That's, and they're going, yes, ka-ching, the same dollar signs. And they're going, that's probably worth between, if that went on the market now, between four and eight pounds. <laughs> and the people are like, damn, I've travelled all this way to this goddamn stately home. And some woman had a thing. It was a table thing. It was a cabinet. And she's gone, oh, it's Chinese, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, it's definitely not Chinese. I know enough about Shinwazari to know that that looks Japanese. And the guy went, actually, that's Japanese. And I was like, yes! It's like I'd watched University Challenge or something and got one right. I was like, god damn, I am an expert. And then she was hugely disappointed by, you know, there weren't enough zeros on the end of its valuation. But 17th and 18th century Shinwazari, um, this was a huge aesthetic um, interest. A lot of this stuff was produced in England and sold in England um, as, you know, China. It was, it was China stuff. It was, it was willow pattern stuff. Um, a friend of mine um, lived in Australia for a while and she used to sell China crockery and all this sort of stuff in markets. And she had all of this willow pattern stuff. And this, there was this, this Chinese guy came up and he was going, but what... What is this? What is this shit? What is this stuff? He really liked it, and she's going, "Oh yeah, yeah, it's actually like it's actually English. It's made in England." And he was going, "Oh," and he really wanted to buy it, but he couldn't buy it because he couldn't believe that it was made in England, because it was willow pattern Chinese uh, stuff. And she was gutted because she could have made a killing, but but didn't. Um, so. No, why, why is China a fascinating thing? And why, why does a fascinating thing stop being fascinating to us? There are often historical reasons. There was a growth of um, interest in, in all things Greek. So as J.J. Clark writes, Enthusiasm for China, though widespread, was by no means universal and began to suffer a significant decline towards the end of the 18th century, by which time the cults of Shinwazari and Sinophilism like love of Chinese things, had run their natural course and completely lost their impetus. The revival of Hellenism, you know, kind of classical Greek architectural styles. Um, following the excavations of the remains of Pompeii in mid-century, contributed to the eclipse of Sinomania, as did the expulsion of the Christian missionaries from China in 1770. So China functioned as a kind of muse as this mystical other different thing for a while but as soon as something more interesting comes along coupled with something negative it starts to lose its you can't quite put it on a pedestal and idolize it and kind of you know worship it in the same sort of way you go hang on a minute they're actually um, kicking out Chinese missionaries there, there's hostility to European ideas and there's this really interesting stuff going on in Italy this rediscovery of Italian aesthetics um, can change things. So you can ask this, you can look at this stuff, you can think, well, why is something, why, why do things go out of fashion? Why do things come into fashion? And why do they go out of fashion? Why, when on that lecture a few weeks ago, I was talking about the macrobiotic diet, and that was such a massive thing, a massive diet style, um, that... I think one person in the room had heard of it, or no one had really heard of the macrobiome. Yeah, I think, I think one person heard of it. You think about that. The reason we're interested in specific things and turned off by other things, maybe revulsed by them or scared by them, often has quite complicated cultural and, and um, economic causes. So you can think about that in your, um, in your work if you want. Why is this popular now? Why was it not popular then? Why does something go out of fashion? Um, Rousseau. 
who was a huge philosophical, intellectual voice, um, was also a very anti-Chinese voice. Um, Rousseau is famous for his kind of noble savage idea. He's probably one of that's his most sort of famous idea, like thinking about states of time and existence outside of society. And and so Rousseau would imagine a state of nature where there's noble savages. How do they behave? What is life like before society? As a way to critique existing institutions. So Rousseau doesn't use China. Rousseau thinks of China as a society, as barbaric as any society, and actually um, really looks down on it, really dislikes it, imagining, preferring to imagine a kind of timeless state of nature in the past. And also because at the time of his writing, um, argues Clark, where the culture of China had once seemed fresh and provocative, it now took on the character of torpor and apathy, by contrast with the supposed vigour and progressiveness of Europe, and Sinophilia gave way to a new Orientalist enthusiasm, India. So it's China first, and then India. Um, and this is a, um, a slight interjection from Jane Iwamura's book. This is a great book, by the way, Virtual Orientalism. I recommend that if you're thinking about, um, you know, writing about film representations of East Asia and so on, you have a look at least the first chapter of this, Virtual Orientalism, the fab book. So she, um, she looks at the history of American thought and she looks at the interest of, um, uh, of thinkers like Ralph Waldo Emerson and Thoreau and Walt Whitman on Hindu thought through the 19th century. So these writers drew on the mysterious East to pose an implicit critique of the effects of industrialization and technological change. We've seen this theme before in the, in the lectures running up to this. When you live in an... So, so if we're talking about industrialization in the 19th century, you can start... That can, that, that's pretty grim. Industrialization is grim, right? Grim. And so you start to imagine nature and you start to imagine otherworldliness, things that are outside of capitalism, outside of industrialization. And in the 19th century, it was India that was standing as the figure of that. Um, and Whitman, for Whitman, Asian culture is even figured as the source of America's salvation, the idea that we can um, look to another culture and gain salvation from it. Um, so China was the main object of uh, interest in the Enlightenment. But during the Romantic period, so that's the Romantic poets, that's all your Wordsworth, Byron, Shelley, Coleridge, all these people in the British context. And in Germany, it's much, it's, it's much larger. Romanticism is a much larger thing than in Britain. Um, it's India. India becomes the, the major source of, of interest and poetics, and aesthetics, and fantasies. Why is that? Well, in terms of, um, you know, basic theory of Marxism, the basic theory of Marxism, an ideology, is that the economic base determines something to do with the ideological superstructure, the ideas, and also in Marxism, it's the ideas of the ruling class are always the dominant ideas. So, the East India Company has been regarded as the kind of the real start of the British Empire. It was a private company. It was only subsequently taken into ownership by the, the Crown, by the Queen. And it was essentially commercial interests of Europe that, that forced and developed the um, processes of colonialism, which became associated with the British Empire. So it was the commercial interests of Europe, especially those of the East India Company, that provided the main vehicle for the passage of ideas between India and Europe in the Romantic period. So it's kind of not surprising that India becomes something that people are thinking about and maybe fantasizing about because the commercial and military interests of European powers, especially Britain, especially the East India Company, are taking place at that time. So it's, if you think about this, there's a really famous um, quotation from Walter Benjamin, 
which is something that I've often pondered, and I still often do, but this is a good way of illustrating it. Walter Benjamin said, every document of civilization is a document of barbarism, or barbarity, I forget. He, he wrote it in German, so how have you translate that? And if there's lots of ways that that can be applied, it's quite hard to think, well, hang on, how could, how could like, the writing of romantic poets or romantic thinkers or philosophers or artists be a document of barbarity? And you go, well, you could connect it back to this. If you're philosophic, you might be an innocent artist somewhere in some hills in the Lake District, right? Painting pictures or, or writing poetry, <coughs> thinking about India in a time outside of the industrial world. The cause of that thinking and the material that you're thinking through is connected to economic, well, barbarism, barbarity, violence, exploitation, um, and so on. So that's a kind of, hmm, um, take on it. It's also quite close to the Marxist theory of ideology. So in Germany, in the German context, I don't know if any of you know any of this stuff, if you ever will, but I'll, I'll just let you know it in case it's relevant in future. Um, thinkers like Herder, Goethe, Hegel, Schelling, Schlegel, Schopenhauer, all hugely interested in, and, and their thought is organised around thinking through the challenge of kind of Indian philosophies and Indian religions and Indian worldviews um, for thinking about changing the world and also like connections to the, to the divine. You've got a lot of kind of spiritual interests here. The romantic poets were, were hugely interested in experiencing nature as a way to connect with the divine, to connect with... You know, they were kind of hippies, really. Um, and hippies are kind of romantics. Um, Schopenhauer. So you have certain philosophers like Hegel. He, he was interested in, in philosophies of India. Hegel said things like, you know, Hegel would, was very Western and very kind of modern thinker and would say stuff like, you know, civilization was born in the East. Which way is East and West? Well, whatever, I'll do East here, right? <laughs> um, civilization is born in the East, born in China, right? And it goes, blah, 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 and it matures in the West. That's not a direct quote from Hegel. I don't know how he would render, blah, 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 blah. It's, but something like that, right? Hegel... It's like it's but that's where it's born in the east, but where it grows up is in the west. And you think, oh, that's problematic. So Hegel saw the philosopher, philosophy of India as belonging irrevocably to the past. But Schopenhauer, in the nineteenth century, saw um, the philosophy of India as being key to contemporary philosophical life. So I did a little um, image search on Google for Schopenhauer, and he came up with cool quotes like this, so our religions will never at any time take root the ancient wisdom of the human race will not be supplanted by the events in Galilee, on the contrary Indian wisdom flows back to Europe and will produce a fundamental change in our knowledge and thought this is still a very fashionable idea very influential, I don't want to dismiss it by saying fashionable, strong idea there's a strong hold of this idea you have um, lots of people who are kind of we might call them Orientalists in this way. Go like, well, let's have a deep connection with these non-European philosophies and we can change the world. Think as like Peter Sloterdijk, who, who is, is still chugging along. Um, and he is a contemporary philosopher. And he's totally <coughs> Orientalist in the same way as this. So that's Orientalism not in a kind of negative way. Orientalism can often, like, it can often be a... a a possibly progressive thing when you go, this society, shit, let's imagine another society, okay, ancient China or ancient India, that's got to be better, let's change this society to be more like the way we imagine the past. Not always necessarily a good thing though, um, but it's not necessarily a bad thing either. So through the late 19th century you start to see the institutionalization of um, Things like Buddhist societies, new translations, new publications. You have to think about the, the, the importance and the work of translations because until you've got a translation of something um, from, a, from a distant culture, distant country, distant language, you've got nothing. You've just got hearsay. Until you've got a society 
that can say we have connections to these other places or we've, we've got access to these other traditions, then it's just a mush, it can just evaporate, be lost. So societies work to kind of promote and to um, disseminate and to educate in certain ways. And these translations of Chinese thought and culture influence poets like Yeats and Pound, um, who aren't, who, you know, Ezra Pound's not a straightforwardly kind, he's a, a great modernist poet, but also, you know, anti Semitic, pro Nazi, there's all sorts of problems there. But then again, then again, East Asian thought. Indian thinkers have not always been, they're not totally like right on, man. There's often, they're often connected with some kind of ultra right wing and nationalist groups um, in different ways. So, there's an argument, especially if you um, look at um, Jane Iwamura's book. No, no, not Jane Iwamura. Which book am I thinking of now? Yeah, Jane Iwamura's book uh, on virtual Orientalism. That the Japanese philosopher Suzuki dissects something, <coughs> Suzuki, I can't remember his middle name, who was massively popularised in the 1950s, and we'll come back to Suzuki um, next week, as an image, the image of the, um, of the Japanese or the <coughs> Oriental sage. So Suzuki was one of the first people who was translating and communicating ideas about Zen Buddhism to the West. So his kind of trips to America had been, had been ongoing through the first half of the 20th century. Um, but then there was the war, um, and Japanese stuff wasn't particularly popular in North America during the Second World War. But after the Second World War, and Suzuki was coming back to America, when there were television cameras as well, and Suzuki became something of a celebrity. So, in the interwar period, the writings of D.T. Suzuki helped to awaken the Western mind to the strange but enticing world of Zen. So it's a new thing in the West in the 1950s. Following the defeat of Japan in 1945 and the lowering of cultural barriers between that country and the West, Suzuki's writing reached a wide audience and elicited warm acclaim throughout America and Europe. Now, after the end of the Second World War, America effectively occupied most of Japan for at least 10 years. Um, and in that time, Japan was they were kind of stamping down anything militaristic, anything. Japan had been, you know, for a long time training for this, and then, you know, military, war, boom, and then they're down. So Japan was scary. Something like Zen comes along. Now, Zen is the opposite of militaristic activity, right? It's, it's sitting, meditating, communing with, not even communing, just, just like taking the stylus off the record and just nothing. That's Zen. That's not a scary image. That's something we can, especially after a world war, that's an appealing image. Shall we just chill out for a while? Yeah. So, so Zen has, has that appeal to it as well. And it's also, well, in terms of like the counterculture, it's also an extremely appealing um, process. So in the wake of the Second World War, um, non-Western philosophies became very popular among people who regarded Western institutions as responsible for the Holocaust in Europe and the atomic bombs in Japan. Like, what, what produced that? You know, that's mass production, that's Christianity, that's Western institutions, all of these things, Western religions, Western institutions. So people go, sod that. Zen is anti-institutional. There's, it's not meant, to, you don't need a priest, you don't need an authority, you just need to commune with yourself. So, and this is from um, J.J. Clark in page 99. He argues that Taoism is the last, has been the last major wave of Eastern philosophy to break over the Western mind. It's interesting, I mean, that I suppose the yin-yang is probably still the most popular... I mean, how, how can I verify this, right? It's going to be hard to verify. But that's a popular image, right? I've got one tattooed on me. Maybe You can, you can date people, can't you? You can, you can radiocarbon date the age of someone by their tattoos, right? 
I'm only glad that I wasn't of the generation that had like blue scribbles. It's like, <laughs> this will never go out of fashion. I want blue scribbles all the way up my arm, please. Possibly neck and face. Never go out of fashion. I will never regret this decision. So I'm of the age where you can just get yin yang somewhere. <laughs> yin yangs are cool. And I stand by that to my dying day. I actually had it topped up. It started to fade a bit, so I got, I got it topped up. And I would do so again. Anyway, I might get a big yin yang, and that can just be the yin yang in the middle of the yin yang. It'd be like ultra philosophical. Taoism. Um, so, Taoism, it, so it's not just a tattoo type thing, it's not just a, it's not just a fashion. Um, so, so J.J. Clark argues towards the end here that it has in recent decades begun to emerge from the shadows and to play a not insignificant role in the formation of radically new conceptions of mind and nature. Taoism um, has arguably influenced an awful lot of Western thinking, but also you know, contemporary Eastern thinking of all types, because it's kind of anti-essentialist. It doesn't have essences. You, you don't. You, so you know all this stuff where, where in your essays you, you hunt down essentialism. Essentialism is bad, right? We know that. Because you can't say all women are, all men are. You can't say that. That's an essentialism. You can't say all French people are, all Germans. You can't do that. That's an essentialism. You know that it's wrong. It's basic kind of prejudice. Taoism doesn't have essences. It has, like... In interplays, it's like a weather system, it has interplays of forces. So it's an anti-essentialist thing, it's about process and flow and change. And this is why Zizek thinks it's ideological, because it means that we don't hold to anything. We go, oh, well that's dissolved then, my pension fund is dissolved. And that's the flux of the universe, it's <laughs> evaporated into yin and yang or something. Anyway, um, and also Westerners have long been interested in um, extracting what interests them from complex and rich philosophical cultural traditions. And ideas like tantric yoga, which are mainly about sex, harmonizing your sex with, with, with nature and the universe and so on, that was a big deal. Um, there were many celebrities through the 1980s who, who were largely known for their interest in tantra, tantric yoga. Um, Things that have that involve little interest in metaphysical speculation, but which offer a way of personal transformation. This is often a characteristic of the way that the modern consumerist world takes up other ideas. It, they, they're all, it all becomes about social, like self transformation, self improvement, self development, which arguably is is very it's very unphilosophical. Actually, it's very aligned with consumerism. Um, I think I said this in, in some seminars the week before last, but one argument is that the difference between, say, so if you were Zizek, right, Zizek might say, this isn't a quote from Zizek, might say that the difference between Buddhism and Western Buddhism is that in traditions like Buddhism, the self is a problem to be solved or dissolved, whereas in Western Buddhism, the self is something to be improved and to be bettered. So we don't lose our sense of self, we actually enhance it, which is entirely aligned with you know, liberal or neoliberal consumerist ideology. So, this is a quote, these are from, um, this is Jane Iwamura, which we'll come back to on the, the I think next week. Um, she looks at the, the, the effects of the, the mass media representation of Suzuki during the American Zen boom in the 1950s. <clears throat> And she argues that the popular narrative and image of the Oriental monk began to emerge in that historical moment. Jane Iwamura, she's written articles and books, said that the figure of the monk, the Oriental monk in Western popular culture, is a, like a strong structuring way of thinking about um, East Asia in, in American popular culture. It's almost like, um, you know, Spike Lee kind of through the 1980s would characterize the problem of being black in American television or cinema is that you'd have to play a stereotypical or that would be a criminal or 
pimp or a prostitute or something really culturally bad. And Spike Lee said in the 80s, if you're black, don't take these roles. Don't play them. Just refuse. Because we need to not have these negative stereotypical representations. Jamie O'Meara says that the ongoing stereotypical representation of uh, East Asian men in American cinema through the 20th century has been essentially this. The Oriental monk in one or another of its several guises. Um, so, Eastern spirituality becomes a stylized religion and consumable um, product. Um, there were other people, so Suzuki was, Suzuki was Japanese and translated Zen um, lessons into English. And then you have figures, lots of figures, people like Alan Watts who grew up he grew up in Japan, lived in China, was American. He translated a lot of these texts into English as well. Because the, what part of the argument has always been that you have to be so immersed in um, these non-Western cultures to be able to get them, to be able to get, say, Zen or Chan Buddhism, to be able to get that. You have to have lived it. And not many Westerners live it. And the people who do live it can't speak English or German, or whatever. So people like, so Alan Watts kind of went, yeah, I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to have a crack at this. And wrote these incredibly popular books like The Way of Zen. And the first sentence of that book, the first sentence um, of the, the Way of Zen, is essentially that, you know, one of, yeah, one of the... Blah, blah, blah. So in the 1950s, da, 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 da. Um, he remarks on the extraordinary growth of interest in Zen Buddhism and in East Asian culture and thought in the West. This, in, this is from, this is the second half of the first sentence. This interest has increased so much that it seems to be becoming a considerable force in the intellectual and artistic world of the West and suggests that it's connected, concerned, no doubt, with the prevalent enthusiasm for Japanese culture, which was one of the constructive results of the late war. After the end of the Second World War, America be, fell in love with Japan. Loved it. Um, obsessed with it, with it, with its aesthetics, with ideas of Zen, with with all the, with its martial arts, with with it, with its style, with its cuisine, with everything. It's an interesting thing, isn't it, to happen? But that's what happened. Um, and all of this really expanded. So you, in the 1960s, you start to get the birth of, of of the hippies. So this is the Beatles. The Beatles became really interested in all things Indian, in particular. Uh, they became in, very interested in India and LSD at the same time and often conflated these two things and, and twisted them together. Um, but it wasn't just the Beatles. The Beatles kind of represent... And it wasn't everyone everywhere. <laughs> I mean, when, I've, when I speak to people who are like, you know, teenagers or growing up in the 1960s, they're like, no, it's pretty shit, really. Just had a job, went to work, you know, no big deal. Then you have this this idea from like Austin Powers of like swinging London and all this, and the swinging sixties, and ah, it's a bit shit. It was shit in Liverpool, shit in Newcastle. Might have been good on Carnaby Street or something in London, but or in Height Ashbury in San Francisco. But so openness to spiritual alternatives reached full flower in the nineteen sixties. Disillusioned with uh, institutionalized religious practice, many Americans began to look beyond mainstream Christianity for new inspiration and direction. The emergence of seeker spirituality during this period, a movement characterized by a yearning for personal experience and transformation and in which the sacred is less closely tied to religious institutions and communal practice. Orientalist notions of age and spiritual heritages converge with Western disillusion and desire. So, the 1960s sees disillusionment with, with the West, fantasies about non-institutional existence outside of the West, and that's where you start to get these kind of, the, the kind of hippie chic, the hippie look, the hippie style, which is um, merged in with, with Orientalism. Um, so that's that. The next thing I want to talk about is um, the rebel cell, but I think it would be a good time for a break. Um, at this point.